So um, we're going to get directly into the teaching. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1, and this is going to be the scripture that we use as a launching pad to a number of different topics that we're going to talk about tonight. So the first, the first question that I have for you before we read the scripture, when you think of a leader, when you think of a good leader, what are some of the characteristics that you think about? Integrity. Integrity. Honesty. Honesty. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. What else? For the Chris. Patience. Patience. Hard worker. Hard worker. Commitment. Say commitment. <laughs> now, now, let me ask you this. When you think of a bad leader, what are some of the characteristics that you think about? Lack of communication. Angry. Yeah. Lack of communication. Yeah. Poor judgment. Poor judgment. Selfish. Selfish. Not accountable. Not accountable. Amen. What I want to attempt to do tonight as we speak about leadership, I want to be able to define the difference between a secular or a general leader versus a godly leader because there is a difference yeah. amen so by the time that you leave today you will know the difference between a secular leader and a godly leader amen first timothy chapter 3 verse 1 says this and you can follow along with me on your worksheet it says here is a trustworthy saying whoever aspires to be an overseer someone say overseer, overseer. overseer. desires a noble task in the message translation, it reads like this. If anyone wants to provide leadership, someone say leadership. leadership. If anyone wants to provide leadership in the church, good. You know, when we look at this opening scripture, one of the things that we have to understand is that the Bible tells us to aspire to be an overseer or to be a leader is an honorable ambition. It's not bad to want to do something great for God. How many want to do something great for God? Are you hearing me? Now, one of the things that I want to point out and show you in Scripture is that there has always been a need and a search for leaders. All throughout the Bible, we see God in search of leaders. And some of the Scriptures within your handout are there, says this, 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be the commander. Some translation says leader over his people. So when we look at this scripture, we see that God is rebuking a bad leader for not doing what he asked. And then he goes on and searches for a man that has his heart and puts him in place so that he can continue with what he wants to do. Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30 NIV translation says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. Jeremiah 5.1 says this, Go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, look around and consider, search through her squares, if you can find but one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive this sin. Now when we read those scriptures, what are some of the common themes that you find within those verses? Honest. 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 What else? What are some of the things that you see a common theme or a thread within those scriptures? God is always searching for someone. Looking for somebody. Right? We see that God has always searched for leaders to do His will. A says the Bible shows us that when God finds a person who is ready to lead, to commit to full discipleship and take responsibility for others, that person is used to the limit. Such leaders still have flaws, but despite those limitations, they serve God as a spiritual leader. Such were men like Moses, Gideon, David, Samson, and Jephthah, people that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, right? So I say all that to say this. If you belong to this church, 
One of the things that I want you to understand is that our church places a huge value and emphasis on leadership. We believe that God can use anybody. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that God can use anybody who is committed and aspires to use their giftings for His honor and God's glory. If you remember something from tonight, remember this, that God has called you, God has a plan for you, and God has placed gifts inside of you that weren't meant for you, but they were meant to be a blessing for other people, and they were meant for you to use to advance His kingdom. Say that. Are you hearing me this, Say that. this evening? So there is a need for leadership in this day and age. You don't have to look far. There's need in companies. There's needs in our schools. There are, there's a need for leadership in the police force. There is a need for leadership within the church. But there's a difference between a worldly leader and a godly leader. So when you read the book and you first read the first chapter, the first chapter talks about a Christian leader in the leader's core. And the basis for the entire book revolves around one question. And the question is this, is a Christian leader a leader only in a Christian context? In other words, is a Christian leader only a leader within the church or a religious organization? No, right? The answer is, is in your worksheet. It says a Christian leader leads in any context, whether or not it's professed Christian organization. We don't want to, and listen, this is what I want you to understand about this question. Listen, we want to build you as leaders, not to impact the church. We want to build you as leaders so that you can impact the world. If we can build you to be a leader and you learn the biblical principles of the Bible and you implement those qualities within your work life, you will be successful and you will excel. Amen. I promise you that if, if you dedicate yourself for the next two months, you put into practice what we're going to teach and you learn to live biblical and you learn to implement biblical leadership philosophies, you will not only be promoted, but you will bring glory to God at your workplace. Are you hearing me? Now, I'm a testimony of this. Some of you know and some of you don't know. But part of my testimony, when I came to the Lord, I wasn't educated. I got kicked out of school. I graduated from a continuation school and I could barely read. But when I got into the church, there was classes like this that my church provided and I attended them. And I began to learn about leadership. And I began to trust the pastors and my leaders and I implemented these qualities. And I'll never forget, one day I was asking and praying, God, could you get me a job? I didn't have any experience. And I'll never forget, one of the ladies in the church said, are you still looking for a job? And I was like, I didn't tell anybody I was looking for a job. But I said, yeah, I want a job. Well, good. I told my boss about you, and they want to meet you. I said, okay, well, what do you do? I work at a bank. Well, the first problem was I was a thief before I came to the Lord. I remember going into that interview, and I remember all the questions they were asking me had to do with leadership. And I remember answering the questions and feeling comfortable. So to make the long story short, I eventually got hired and, and, and I don't say this to boast, but I kept getting promoted. I kept getting promoted. And I remember I learned something. By studying the life of Joseph, I realized that if I work at my job as if I was working for the Lord, not only would I bring Him glory, but the people that I work for notice that I was dedicated. See, what I'm trying to tell you is this. If you're not happy with your job, don't say anything to me if I ask you what time you show up and you tell me you're always late. Hmm. Yeah. We as believers should be the ones to show up first and the last ones to leave. Come on, somebody. We should be the one to go the extra mile and not try to take shortcuts. Are you hearing me? Amen. So what am I trying to tell you? If you implement the principles of the Bible at your workplace, I promise you you will succeed. Because a Christian leader is not just a leader within the church. He is a leader everywhere he or she goes. Yeah. 
Our mandate, our mandate, he says, is to lead in a Christ-like manner regardless of the context. In other words, if it's in the church, we want to lead like Jesus. If it's at the workplace, we want to lead like Jesus. If it's at the construction site, we want to lead like Jesus. If it's at the bank, we want to lead like Jesus. If we're in sales, we don't want to compromise our integrity for a sale because we're going to get more on our check. We want to be integral and we want to lead like Jesus. Are you hearing me? Our mandate is to lead like Christ. So three says the distinctives of Christian leadership. So what is distinctive about a Christian leader? What is the difference between leaders in general and Christian leaders? Well, the answer is a Christian leader is a Christian from the inside out. Are you hearing me? Not from the outside in. What do I mean by that? A Christian leader is a Christian from the inside out, not the outside in. Yes. Um, we, we're leaders because within our hearts, there's a uh, comes from the, the heart, and we have, you know, we're not just learning how to look the part, but how to truly be the part. Not just learning how to serve, but truly learning how to love people. Yes. And it's coming from the inside, and then eventually, what's happening on the inside is transformed to the outside, and there's no inner struggle. Yep. It's peaceful. Versus when you do it from the outside in. When you look the part, but you don't feel the part, you don't like people. You get frustrated. You, you Very true. Let, you know, you, yeah. So the difference, and one of the things that makes us different, is the that lead, a Christian leader is a Christian from the inside out. And we'll explain more about that as I want to give you seven distinctives of a Christian leader. Are you, are you with me? Are you getting something? Yes. Amen. So number one, the first distinctive of a Christian leader... In your worksheet, it says, a Christian leader is a Christian. Someone say Christian. Christian. They're not a flesh monster. What do we mean by that flesh monster? Okay? They're not somebody that's all carnal. Okay? They're not someone that makes decisions based off their feelings and their emotions. And listen, I want to challenge you to really pay attention. Really, really grasp this. Really stay focused. Don't let other things take your attention so a Christian leader is a Christian this is the very core of the Christian leader is his or her personal conversion and understanding of who God is in other words there was a time within your life that you've experienced who God was and you accepted him within your heart who can remember when they first came to an understanding of who God was and you asked him to be Lord in your life right so, so from the core, when I say from the inside out, a Christian leader leads from an understanding of who God is. According to Scripture, Christians are those who have accepted Christ as their personal Savior, and they have recognized that they're sinners in need of a Savior. Are you hearing me? And you can do more of your study there. We provided some Scriptures, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. So the first one is... A Christian leader is a Christian. Number two, a Christian leader is a committed follower. Someone say commitment. Commitment. When someone's committed, what are characteristics of a committed person? Consistency. Consistency. Discipline. Discipline. What else? When you think of somebody that's committed. Faithful. Faithful. Good stuff. Huh? Rain or shine, right? A Christian leader is a committed follower. Now it says there in your worksheet, since not all Christians are leaders, Christian leaders must take another step. After they come to faith in Christ, they must put themselves under the Lordship of Christ because being a Christian is not enough. See, one of the things that you've been hearing me say is that discipleship is for everybody. But leadership is for a few committed, growing disciples. So we need to write that down. There's a difference. Discipleship is for everybody. But leadership is for a few committed, growing disciples. God can use anybody to lead. 
If there was ever a time where we were experiencing a leadership vacuum, in other words, where, where there is some places, there's some leadership that is non-existent, it is today. And I want to talk to the ladies for a second because, listen, ladies, we need some of you to take your place within the church. There are young ladies out there right now that are prostituting their bodies and they need a godly, spirit-filled woman that was willing to take them under their wing and teach them the right way of life. Yes, sir. Come on, Come on. There are some young ladies, if we don't grab them right now in the church, if we don't give them attention right now, somebody else will out there. Listen, ladies, we, we, we need to band together. We really need to start discipling and becoming disciples ourselves. Listen, and all the men, listen, it's time. It's time to put foolish ways and foolish things aside. And it's time to pray and disciple men that are willing to learn about the love and life-changing power of Jesus Christ. I say that with that much passion because a Christian leader is a committed follower, and what this consists of, of them taking another step and coming under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. See, I'm talking about surrendered life unto the Lord. When someone comes under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, what picture do you have? What pictures does that paint in your mind? When someone comes under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Servant. Somebody that works on 100% and not just 70%. Someone that works on 100% not just 70%. Someone that obeys. Someone that obeys. Someone that obeys. Right? Yeah. When we talk about lordship, in other words, there's an understanding that my life is not my own. To you, I, it's, it's those words that we sing, right? My life is not my own. Right? To you I belong, I gave myself. See, we sing songs like that, but we're not really living under the Lordship of Jesus Christ when we go home. Amen. Can you hear me? God says, I want you to show up early. I want you to take over this ministry. I want you to pick up the phone and counsel this person that really gets on your nerves. Come on, somebody. <laughs> The Lordship of Jesus Christ is real. And people that come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ prove their commitment to Jesus. See, the Apostle Paul summarizes this concept in Romans 6, 13, where he writes, Rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone brought me out of death to life, I think I would be in debt to them. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. If someone brought your child from death to life, I don't know about you, but I, I would give everything I have to that person. Amen. Amen. Now we're talking about the living God who willingly died on the cross and experienced a, a, an excruciating pain that you and I couldn't even fathom for the forgiveness and freedom of sin. And it's saying here, rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the part of your body to Him as an instrument of righteousness. This is why we say that we are simply vessels that God can use. Right? We want to be vessels and instruments that that's my prayer. My prayer has always been, since I, since I got saved, I was just a broken young teenager. I came into the church. I had nothing to offer, but I remember saying things like, God, if you can use anybody, God, you can use me. If you can use my life to impact this world, God, use my life. I remember praying, God, I don't know much. I'm willing, though. If you can teach me, God, I don't know how to preach, but if you can give me the boldness to share the gospel, I'll do it. What I'm trying to get across is this. When you truly come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you try things you don't know how to do because you put your trust in Him. Amen. Don't 
wait for to be qualified. This world, when you go to a job interview, they're going to ask you for your resume, which lists all your qualifications. But let me give you a little secret about who God is. God's not looking for your qualifications. He's looking for your heart. And if you have the right heart, he will qualify you to do the job. And you don't have to qualify. You don't have to prove yourself. You just have to show that you're willing to come under the lordship of our Lord and Savior. Amen. See, through Paul, through this, Paul directs, though Paul directs Romans 6 towards all believers, it's important that those who lead, listen to me, set the example for those who follow. If God has called you to lead, part of your commitment to being a committed follower you got to live a good example so that others that are called to follow will follow the right model. Yeah. Right? If followers are to make an unwavering commitment to Christ, leaders who profess to be committed Christ followers must lead the way to committed discipleship. Yeah. Right? And this is where I'm glad, you know, I see so many of you come out because I often hear things like, I want to be discipled, I want to be discipled. And, 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 and in settings like this, listen, our church is growing to a place where me and my wife can't disciple everyone. But it's in areas like this where you can gain the heart, you can learn things, and you can implement them within your life, and then you can teach others. Number three, a Christian leader's source of truth, and this is important. This is a big difference between a general leader and a Christian leader. A Christian leader's source of truth is divine revelation. See, there's something that theologians call special revelation is number A. Special revelation consists of the Bible and the life of Jesus. Special revelation is based on God's special grace. You can look that up in Titus 2.11. And it provides us with God's special truth. This type of revelation, listen to me, comes from studying the Word of God and learning to pray. God wants to give you special revelation where He reveals to you what's known as the deep things of God. Deuteronomy tells us that the deep things of God, right? He reveals them to us. They belong to the Lord, but He wants to reveal them to us. And then there's what you call general revelation. That's me. And general revelation is what theologians talk that is God's truth found in nature, history, and other sources. You can find that in Psalms 19, 1 through 6. See, general revelation is based on God's grace, and it provides man with God's general truth since he is the source of all truth. Now, the application to leadership is that Christian leaders draw their primary theory about leadership and truth from the Bible. There are a lot of leadership gurus out there that will give you a good leadership class. But a Christian leader, source of truth is divine revelation. In other words, every, every truth within my life, I line it up from the Word. Everything that I choose to live by is through the Word. Number four, are you getting something? Yeah. Amen. A Christian leader emphasizes godly leadership. And this is a huge one. When we talk about the difference between a general leader and a Christian leader, a Christian leader emphasizes godly character. The greatest crisis in the world today is leadership. And the greatest crisis of leadership is a crisis of character. Are you hearing me? The greatest crisis in the world today is leadership. And the greatest crisis in leadership is character. Now what is character? Character is the sum total of a person's qualities, both good and bad, that reflect who he or she is. Your character is who you are when nobody is watching. Your character is what you really say within your mind and not what you did. Right? How many hold your tongue and like inside you say, all right, but inside you're like cussing. <laughs> Come on, don't look at me like that. 
Sometimes on the outside, we put on a good show, but on the inside, right, we're violent in our minds. Right? Right? Some of you are impatient when it comes to your waiter. Your waiter doesn't bring your food. You can see yourself bashing their face in with your plate. Huh? You call that, it's true. Right? Wait at me, isn't it true? Okay, I'm not the only one. <laughs> I don't act like that anymore, but it's true. Character is who you are when nobody is watching. B says this, godly character emphasizes the qualities that the Bible prescribes. Godly character is the single ingredient that qualifies a Christian to lead other people. So when we talk about the difference between a secular leader and a godly leader, a godly leader always understands that his character is the one thing he needs to guard. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1, the Apostle Paul provides the character qualifications for leaders during that time. And one of the most Powerful qualifications that the Apostle Paul mentions to all leaders is found at the end. He says, your character must be above reproach. What does that mean? If he says, your character must be above reproach, what was he talking about? What does that mean? Anybody? Don't give somebody something to talk about. Very true. Anybody else? You can't live like everybody else, right? There's a word that I was taught, and I pray, listen, write this down. These are the type of principles that kept me as a Christian and kept me standing as a leader. My pastor would always tell me, Eric, you have to live a blameless life. Someone say blameless. Blameless. Someone who lives above reproach lives blameless. In other words, they don't put themselves in a situation where somebody will even question their decision making. A Christian leader leads from a place of godliness. Number five, a Christian leader understands the importance of motives. Someone say motives. Now this is heavy because it says the leader's character concerns the leader character concerns what he or she does, which is his or her behavior. But motives explains why a leader behaves a certain way or does what he or she does. Ultimately, listen to me, our motives directly or indirectly affect our character. So this is why you've got to be careful. You can look the part on the outside, but your motives will eventually be exposed. If you're doing something because you want the approval of man, your motives will be exposed when they don't give you a pat on the back. Amen. When you do something for someone and you expect something in return and you didn't do it because of the love of God, you will get mad and bitter towards that person when you give your own and they give nothing back. What am I trying to say? Your motives will directly or indirectly affect your character. This is why we got to lead from the inside out, not the outside in. When we lead from the outside in, we put on a facade, I'm doing everything for the Lord, but on the inside we're doing it because we have bad motives. But when we lead from the inside out, we do it from a place of love. Everything I do, I do it under the Lord. So whether somebody gives me a high five or not, it's okay because I know God sees it. Are you hearing me? Ultimately, our motives affect our character. B says the Apostle Paul, and I love this. It says the Apostle Paul's four motives for leadership is found in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2-9. Now, I want to read this to you because here you can find four motives that the Apostle Paul lived by. Are you with me? Follow along. It says, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, When you yourselves know, dear brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not a failure, you know how badly we had been treated at Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. Yet, yet our God gave us much, yet our God gave us the courage to declare His good news to you boldly. In spite of great opposition, you can see that we were not preaching with a, 
with, with, with deceit or impure motives or trickery. For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. Never once did we try to win you with flattery or you will, you, you will have known. And God is our witness that we were not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. As for human praise, we have never sought it from you or anyone else. So I want to go over quickly the, the, the four motives that the Apostle Paul lived by. Number one, his first motive was to spread the gospel. You can see that in verse two. He says, where, in other words, wherever Paul went, you would find that he passionately spread the gospel. That was his first motive. His second motive was to please God. Someone say, please God. Please God. He was concerned with God's view more than man's view. He was concerned what God thought about his leadership more than what man thought about his leadership. You got to live, listen to me, to please the audience of one. You got you to catch that. You got to live for the audience of one. Brother Eric, Brother Everett, when you guys are up here praying, you're not playing for us. You're playing for the audience of one. Amen. When you sing a song, you're not singing for people to hear. You're singing for the audience of one. Amen. I am far more concerned about what God thinks about my leadership more than I'm concerned than what people think about my leadership. As a leader, you have to learn to please God, not man. Number three, Paul's third motive for leading, to tell people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Mm. Amen. Don't be a people pleaser. Sometimes you're going to have to tell somebody the truth and the truth is going to hurt. But let me tell you something. When they figure out the truth, the truth is going to set them free. <laughs> and number four, the fourth motive of leadership for the Apostle Paul, his fourth motive for leadership was to serve God, not serve for personal gain. You cannot do this to help, or you cannot want to help somebody to get something. That's not why we're in this. Listen, the repayment for leadership, for godly leadership, this is going to be your payment. Save souls. Amen. Save souls. Amen. When I took this role of a pastor, I didn't take it for money. I didn't take it for praise. I didn't take it because I wanted people to think I was cool. I did it because I truly wanted to see life saved. Say that. When we, were, when we didn't have that many people and, 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 and we, we would show up and there was only a few, we stuck to it. We stuck to it. Why? Because we knew there were souls waiting. Some of you got to learn to stick to it because souls are depending on you. Yes, your life might not be all in shape right now. Don't focus on that. Stick to it. Stick to it. Stick to it. Stick to it. Don't focus on that. Stick to it because God is faithful. God can break chains and God can save. give up just because you failed you got to stand up you got to stand your ground Amen. and remember that the enemy doesn't like you Amen. number six now I'll be closing a Christian leader serves through the power of the Holy Spirit see unbelievers and unbelieving leaders do not have the Holy Spirit resident in their lives and have no option but to lead by their own human power However, when a Christian accepts Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit resides within him, and they have the Spirit's power to lead lives that serve and glorify God. See, this is what you need to understand. At some point, you may have a gift of leadership, and you might be able to get things done, but if you want to make an eternal impact, then you're going to need the Spirit of God. You're going to need the power of God. Charisma will only get you so far. Gifting will only get you so far. You might be good with electronics. You might have a good voice. You might know how to manage. But at some point, you're going to need to learn to lead in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Are you hearing me? We put our trust in the Lord. Now, how, how, how do you walk in the Spirit's power? You got to read your Bible and you got to learn to pray. 
The anointing and the Spirit of God will come upon your life as you seek the Lord. The more you spend time with God, listen, the more you realize how wicked your heart really is. The more that you pray the prayer, like, listen, I'm afraid to pray these prayers, but I do them anyways. God, can you show me anything within my heart that's not right? <laughs> right? I say it all holy too, like, God, is there anything within my heart that's not of you? <laughs> and I'm in prayer, and then he begins to show me. Yeah, yeah. You still got pride, boy? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't stop, this whole thing will collapse. You hear me? You need to love your wife. Amen. You need to sacrifice for your children. Amen. You don't have the right to choose who you want to lead and who you don't want to lead. I brought them into your fold. Amen. Some of you that want leadership, listen. Don't look for the one that looks good. Look for the one that may not make it. Amen. And dedicate your life to believing in them. Are you hearing me? Amen. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Not, not, not you in this room. <laughs> Me and my wife have always attracted knuckleheads. <laughs> I think because I was a knucklehead. She was a knucklehead. But because of where you come from, listen, God is going to use you to truly, truly break bondage in the people's hands. Amen. And you're going to need the power of God. Amen. Because words ain't going to do it. Listen to me. A good sermon is not going to do it. It's the power and the anointing yeah. behind the sermon yeah. that's going to break the yoke. Yeah. And lastly, a Christian leader practices. Someone say practice. practice. Godly servant leadership. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 and 28, Jesus defines servant leaders as those who humbly serve others because they love them. We got to serve people because we love them, not because we have to or we feel guilty. Humility describes our manner of leadership or how we lead. Service is the essence of our leadership from which other people benefit. As Christians, we are not here to serve ourselves, but others, and love is the motive for our leadership. That is the big difference between godly leadership and worldly leadership. Godly leadership serves from a place of love that is committed, a love that is defined by God's example. Greater love hath no man than this, than he that lay his life down for his friend. Listen, some of you gotta start laying your life down for you. You know what it means to physically lay your life down in this context? That means, yes, we might have to do extra work. We might have to show up early. We might have to do five jobs. We might have to serve in the children's ministry, usher. We might have to also be on the worship team. We might have to learn to do all these different things and, and hope that if we continue doing them, somebody will come in and help. That's why we started the church. That's why we continued with the church. We maintained and kept because of the love of God. Had it not been for the love of God, I don't know where I would be. Had it not been for the love of God, I don't know where my wife would be. Had it not been for the love of God, I don't know where some of you would be. I don't know if your family would have talked to you. I don't know if you would have had a relationship with some of the people within your family. But thank God that he did you forgive. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. That his love is true. And I say that to say this. I've been stressing the church. We need some of you to raise your commitment now. Show up on Sunday, every Sunday. Amen. Show up on Wednesday. Show up for God. And show up to serve other people. Because you never know when the person that came. Imagine this. I close here. Imagine if somebody, God designed somebody just like you to come in that service. But we chose to stay at home because we were just a little bit tired. I couldn't reach them because I'm not like you. They came to the service. They lifted their hands and they left and we never hear, heard from them again. But it was your responsibility to reach them. 
This is why you've got to show up. I, I always taught that. Before I was a pastor, Eric, you've got to show up every week. you got to show up every week. Because souls weigh in the balance. Tonight, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to ask you to stand with me.